Just close the door. Do you see it now? Okay. So, how are you all doing? Good. Coping with a uh, LSAT students not uh, giving up yet. <laughs> it's okay. It's very hard in the beginning, but then it's get a little bit harder. But, uh, <coughs> okay, so um, I still am very bad with names, so I still don't remember all your names. So if you can, uh, when you answer questions or ask questions, I don't, I don't want to, to deter you from asking questions, but um, if you can just repeat your name, then it will be uh, good. So uh, we'll go over the questions that... Uh, you required or recommended to do uh, for this and it's regarding the protein structure and function at least the first part what we got a chance to go over in the previous lessons so um, <coughs> as you remember probably we discussed that for headaches and so what are the interactions that stabilize uh, the alpha headaches do you someone has gone over the questions B? Okay, does someone think, think something else? Or hydrogen bond between several parallel alpha helixes? Um, this, is, this is not the, the right answer, but actually I can understand maybe where you're coming from because we saw like this figure where you have two alpha helixes or something that are interacting together. Maybe that's what you think about, but there's a question about the, the the alpha x itself, the secondary structure, so, uh, and your name? Yeah. No, okay. So, um, you're correct, and hydrogens bond between chemical groups of the protein backbone, or like we saw in the uh, previous class, where you have a, a hydrogen bond between uh, the oxygen and the hydrogen that attached to the amine group, or the nitrogen of the backbone of the and you, and you can see here that all the side chains are just depicted as general R, and they don't they don't play a part uh, in the stabilization of this uh, of this structure. And hopefully, also the movie that didn't work last time. So, so in general, no, I don't want to do that. So this is like a molecular. What are you doing? Wow. <laughs> How did they do that? Okay. So, uh, I will not point. There's a molecular structure. Uh, as a, a lot of times, what I wanted to see is also different types, uh, different ways to show like proteins or molecules. Here, the, the hydrogen are not shown at all, for example. And these bonds, they just show like for, like as a bond between the nitrogen and the oxygen. Okay. So we, don't get confused from that. So we get a representation. This is normally when you see a 3D structure of a protein, a lot of time it will be depicted as the bows and ribbons or a representation. 
and this is how you will uh, how an alpha helix uh, would be presented. Yeah. Yeah. The protein backbone is the is the link between what we what we discussed is it goes like a sequence of it's actually the polypeptide chain what we and it's a alpha alpha carbon then a carbon then a peptide bond then a amine group and so so on and so forth so this um, <coughs> it's all the amino acids the chains of all amino acids is the protein backbone okay. The part that doesn't involve like the side residues, or what uh, is different between uh, all amino acids. The residual group are, are are what makes amino acids different from one another. So, for example, if you have like proline that we saw, it has like this loop residual group, or a, a glycine that just ha has a hydrogen as a residual group. That that that's what changes between amino acids. Question? No. Okay. So, second question. Every dihedral, and we, uh, I mean phi or psi, uh, phi or psi what the angles that we talked about in last lesson, and a polypeptide backbone has a certain range of possible uh, values. Yeah. Uh, okay. What's the answer? It's B. There is a relatively large range for a small residue amino acid. Okay. Do you remember exactly a specific uh, example? Maybe. Um, I, we talked about the two amino acids. Yeah. I don't remember which one is the one. Like proline is one of them. Yeah. I think that's the one that the residue is connected to yeah. the cell, so it has a small range. Um, and I don't remember the other one, which is like. Expensive. So the other one, I always, I always repeat these two because they're special. So the, the other one is glycine, okay. And your name? Uh, Gab. Gab, okay. So you're right. Um, and as we saw in previous uh, in the previous class, these are our channel plots that depict the possible angles of every amino acid. Uh, I'm not going to repeat exactly what the, that means, but uh, we saw that for proline it's very restrictive. Uh, in general, in general, here, proline is a special case, but actually, in general, if it, if, if uh, amino acid has a large residue, this is not a typically large residue, okay, that's why it's also a special case, but uh, if an amino acid has a large molecule attached to it, then uh, you, can, uh, you can understand that there will be restrictions on the movement of the, of the angles that can occur. The, the large chain doesn't have restrictions in, in respect to the... It really depends specifically, it's not a rule. So let's say if you have a lot of... Uh, a chain that's composed of a lot of amino acids that have large groups, then they might interfere with one another. But it's not like a rule. In general, you can have... Um, like the, the proximity, the, the proximate amino acid also has an effect on the angles. Okay, so it's not like... Uh, exactly, they can have like steric interference. Uh, Okay, so third question, protein structural, structural motifs exist, Ma mark incorrect sentences. So motifs are different combinations of secondary structure, is that correct? Yes. Motif implies, a motif implies the protein function. Do you remember like a specific protein function? Maybe? Yeah. It binds the, one of the things that we talked about is calcium. What you talk about is, is binding of zinc, but it's actually a function to... Uh, no, you saw the answer, but never mind. So uh, what you're talking about, zinc finger is actually the, the role is not binding zinc, but to bind DNA normally, but it does bind zinc. Here the role is, uh, is actually to bind calcium, and we'll discuss these proteins today also. And... So the correct answer, as you saw before, a motif will, uh, <coughs> or the incorrect, uh, a motif will induce the exact same sequence in different proteins. Uh, include, sorry. So it's not, it's not the exact same sequence. We, saw, we said 
that there is a consensus sequence and there is a large difference between consensus and exact. So, for, uh, like, if we see here, like on this structure, only these amino acids are, they have a rule regarding them and even they can change between two amino acids. And all the amino acids here, the other amino acids, are not very, like, there's not a rule for the identity that they have to be. Okay, so this structure can be formed from a variety of amino acids. Of amino acid sequence. So this is the wrong answer. And a protein can have more than one motif. Uh, obviously, like we're, we're talking about the protein motif is normally small, uh, small parts of a protein, and a protein can have several motifs or repeated motifs. And we'll see examples of that later today. Also. So this is the what you were. Uh, your name again? Le Lea. So uh, this is maybe what confused you like uh, before because we have here two alpha helixes that are like interacting with each other. So anyway, last question between homologous proteins, there is. So we talked about homologous proteins in respect to protein evolution in general, but this is a term that you, you, you can use even outside of evolution. So, um, do they have two, two homologous proteins? Do they have an identical uh, sequence of amino acids? Mm -hmm. No. So, what do they have? Right. They have a similar. It's like the, in a sense, it's like a consensus sequence, but not exactly. And um, you can also determine the degree of homology by the similarity between the sequences. And um, what's the other? There's, there's, I'll just, it doesn't matter what's the other uh, answer here. That's correct. D. Is it not exactly the same kind of homology though? Because it's like evolutionary-wise, I mean, two uh, proteins that have the same structure don't necessarily have the same uh, ancestor because uh, yeah. the ancestor is like a um, sequence difference. Yeah. You're right that the, like in evolutionary terms, uh, the identity of the sequence a lot of time implies even the identity of the sequence a lot of time doesn't imply uh, for, for like necessarily uh, proximity in evolution, um, not identity but similarity. That's why we refer to homologous when when you say homologous, it doesn't have to be in the context of evolution. So it, it generally means that the protein is, is similar to one another. An homologous protein is a protein that has similar similarity in structure, function, and normally the sequence, the similarity in sequence and similarity in the secondary and tertiary. Sometimes, sometimes not. Sometimes you can have very small variations in amino acids that will dramatically change the territory structure. If there's two proteins that only give or collect for them, are they called homologous proteins or not? That only the sequence and not the structure? Yeah. Then I would say, well, it depends what you're asking, but in general, for what we're saying, so they're not homologous. Normally, we're talking about when you have both of them, we'll call this uh, them homologous. Yeah? So it it depends. Homology is a, is a, a homology is a wide term in general. So if you're talking about evolutionary uh, homology, then um, normally people just describe like the sequence, okay? But if you're talking about now, if we if we want to talk about two homologous proteins, then a lot of times also the they can be in a sense they can be evolutionary distinct, although in most cases they're not distinct. And we're going to talk about, and for us, it will mean that the, they have a similarity in sequence and structure. Okay? So, like, homologous is, like, not a very well, like, defined word because it means a lot of things. Okay. So, we're left with these, and this is the right answer. So, this is uh, what we talked about, about protein evolution. In this example, is both homology is evolutionary and structurally. And uh, we can see about the, uh, about the example of the hemoglobin that 
even the two subunits are different from one another, are the last split in the evolutionary tree, the, the most recent one. Uh, okay. So, any more questions about the reading or chapter or something like that? No? Everything was very clear? Okay. So, next, uh, previous... Um, we finished the last lesson with this slide and uh, depicting the, so now we're talking about um, how proteins, we're, we're skipping the part about how proteins are made and I told you that we're talking about from the moment that, that proteins are, are produced, what happens to them in the sense of their uh, folding, the modifications, we'll talk also about the regulation in the next chapter. And, uh, the and finally, the degradation of the proteins. So, degradation. So, in vitro or in a test tube or in sterile uh, lab conditions, there's a, a large amount or incredible amount of different conformations that any polypeptide chain or can can uh, fold into. Okay, but in general. Um, this is like, uh, in, terms of, in terms of free energy or in terms of energy, for most protein, they have a single conformation or a single fold that is the most energetically stable or uh, the one that, is, um, that has the least amount of uh, free energy. And this state is called the native state. Okay? So this is a very, in a sense, it's very simplified because a lot of times you, have, you can have these valleys that are a lot larger and as I, as I said in the, big, in the end of the previous lesson, you can have, if you introduce energy to the system, then you can jump entirely outside of the, of the possibility of the protein to fold in, into its native state. But uh, under, a, um, under like sterile conditions or regulated conditions, most protein will form uh, to their, will fold into their native state or na native uh, final folding uh, uh, position. And <coughs> but in vivo, we don't have time to let the, this process can take a very long time in general for, for long proteins. And also you don't know how long the protein will decide to hang out around this area or stuff like that. So in general, we have a very tight, tightly regulated and very controlled mechanism in vivo two, pr two uh, fold proteins. And the molecules are in charge, or the proteins are in charge to fold uh, proteins correctly and to do it also in very, uh, very fast, uh, are named chaperones. So they're a very easy name to remember because they are actually they escort the protein to its uh, proper folding. Like they escort the, I don't know, the lady to the ball. So, um, there are two types of uh, chaperones. Ones, uh, ones we will just call chaperones normally, or molecular chaperones. Uh, and these are uh, small molecules that bind and stabilize the unfolded protein, normally just as it uh, exits, exits the ribosome, the thing that we didn't talk about that produces the protein. And <coughs> the second type is the chaperonin, and it will be more clear in the next. Example. So, in general, when a protein is formed, um, we have these, the, the yellow things here are the molecular chaperones. And so, for example, here we say molecular chaperones consist of HSP70 and its homologs. So, generally, proteins that look like this protein. Okay? So, uh, <coughs> when I say it like that, it doesn't necessarily mean that they have an evolutionary, uh, um, like, relationship between them, although most of the time they will have. Okay, so this protein is called, these proteins, um, for 90% of the proteins in the body, uh, these proteins are sufficient to, um, to catalyze and make sure that the protein is folded in the proper way, and this process also requires ATP. Okay, so it's an energy demanding uh, uh, process. 
And for the rest of the protein, it has a very uh, uh, unique and interesting mechanism in which the, the molecular chaperones escort the protein to uh, a protein that is called, to a class of protein that are called chaperonin. And uh, this is an example of one chaperonin, it doesn't really matter. And in general, these chaperonins are actually like a huge vessel or container, and they actually look like that. Uh, and they, they actually uh, create like a sterile environment or an ideal environment for the protein to fold and not interact with other proteins around it. Okay, so they facilitate, after binding of ATP, actually the structure is like, undergoes very drastic conformational changes. And after, <coughs> uh, after the protein is folded, then all, this whole complex is released and the uh, protein is properly folded. So these proteins, for example, they, they're called HSP, heat shock protein. Do you have any, like, which means a lot of times a protein is named after where it was first discovered or identified. So, um, these proteins were discovered after uh, scientists took cells, heated them up a little bit, not too much, not to kill them, and then they saw that there is a, right after the, the heating of the cells, after the heat shock, they saw a, an incredible elevation of, these, of the amount of these proteins. So can you imagine why, like why, why does a cell need so much of these, so much of these protein after heat shock? Yeah. Well, heat, uh, heat destroys the cell structure, so you have to move things again. Yeah. So generally, heat introduces energy. Energy is not good to uh, is something that uh, can can cause a lot of the proteins to denature, and that's actually what happens when you get a I don't know how you call it, macatron, but uh, uh, when you are exposed to too much heat that the body cannot cool itself, actually the proteins, the proteins in your body start to denature. Start to denature, I mean like uh, unfold from their, uh, from their finest structure. And that obviously is really, really bad. So these, uh, these proteins are actually uh, highly expressed in, in, in order for the cell to um, to refold the proteins uh, properly. Just HSP70, there is a lot. There are a lot more proteins that are like this HSP70. Not specifically only HSP70 is a is a molecular chaperone. Okay. So we also have a movie of that, which will work. In vitro, a denatured protein can refold into its native state on its own. Nonetheless, in vivo protein folding is aided by chaperones in order to increase efficiency and prevent aggregation of misfolded proteins. Molecular chaperones, such as HSP70, assume an open form when bound to ATP. In this form, the chaperones bind nascent polypeptide chains as they're synthesized on ribosomes. The bound ATP is hydrolyzed to ADP. ADP exchange with a new ATP molecule causes the chaperones to switch to a closed conformation, releasing the target protein. A second class of chaperones, the chaperonins, is required to help a small proportion of proteins fold properly. A partially folded or misfolded protein is inserted into the cavity of the chaperonin where it can fold into its native conformation. ATP binding causes the chaperonin to expand and release the protein properly folded. So this is obviously very simplified, right? But uh, like there's a lot of uh, recognition elements in this process. Very, um, it's very complex in general, yeah. Uh, are the chaperones folding themselves? I don't know. Actually, I think that uh, mo most of the time, because chaperones are not, they're not huge molecules, so uh, a lot of times, like proteins or peptides that are short, they don't require like additional uh, help with folding, but uh, I don't know. Okay, so uh, like, like I said before, and this is the, uh, another way to show it, 
there are a lot of ways for a protein to change conformation until it gets reaches the, its native state, and a lot of time it has like also relatively stable conformations on the way to its native state. And actually, so when a protein decides or not, a protein under a certain condition exits this uh, this like energy uh, valley, uh, how would you say, and does not does not fold anymore into its uh, original or native state, normally it's very, very bad, okay? And what I mean bad <coughs> is that all these uh, neurodegenerative diseases in general um, are, or uh, not neurodegenerative in this, in this case, um, are <coughs> uh, have an involvement of misfolded proteins, okay? The most uh, typical example is uh, of the beta-amyloid, in general, you can understand from the name beta amyloid that there is a here that here it's like a, about tau, but it doesn't really matter. In general, what happens is that uh, the misfolding of the of the beta amyloid <coughs> um, causes a creation of beta sheets, okay? And these beta sheets, and also very small, so that so the protein actually looks more or less uh, like this, and it has like two beta sheets or something like that. And then these beta sheets interact with other beta sheets, with other uh, small molecules or small uh, uh, amyloid beta uh, molecules. And because the, the two beta sheets are very similar to one another, and you will see like also one of the that similar proteins that have similar conformation and you put them in large amounts tend to aggregate with one another and tend to form interactions with one, with one another. So. Uh, it's not clear yet if this mechanism or this uh, aggregation is bad, is good or bad for Alzheimer's. In general, it's like an uh, open question or a debatable or a debated question. If these uh, like uh, plaques or you could call them sinus plaques that are formed from aggregation of amino acid beta protein, uh, if there if if it's like a defense mechanism of the body or it's uh, uh, something that causes the disease in general. Okay, so, yeah. Yeah. In the slide, it shows the protein. This? So basically, there are different ways to get to the native state. Yeah. A protein can get to a native state, but it can get to it in different ways. Yeah. So the most stable, the most stable uh, way, the, the most stable conformation is the native state. But in general, there's a lot of ways to... Uh, to get there, yeah, that's exactly what what this uh, figure is about. So in general, we talk about what happens uh, to the protein once it left the ribosome and it folds, in order for it to get to uh, to the conformation that it needs to be active or to do its role uh, in the cell. But in general, there are a lot of other modifications or changes that protein can undergo um, in the cell, and almost every protein in the cell undergoes chemical uh, uh, modification after, uh, after it's produced. And these modifications can either be on both ends of the protein, the C-terminal, like we like to say, and the N-terminal, uh, the N group or the, the amine group or the carboxyl group, or it can uh, uh, be on the internal residues of the amino acids. Okay? On purpose, I show you like different, I'm showing you different ways to write amino acids because <laughs> A lot of times you see an article like AA or stuff like that. So this means amino acid and the residue is like I explained before is the side chain uh, of the amino acid. These modifications alter, uh, determine a lot of uh, what this protein, uh, what, what will be the role of this protein later and also the stability of the protein and the cellular loca uh, location of the protein. So the most, the most common uh, the most common modification uh, that proteins are undergo is N-terminal uh, acetylation or adding of acetyl group, acetyl group, sorry, which is this group here. It happens in one end of the, on the protein. And uh, an ob one observation is that proteins that are not going to, uh, through this modification are rapidly degraded. So actually I read a little bit about it and no, there's no clear... Uh, clue of why, uh, why the, the proteins that are not acetylated are going through rapid uh, degradation. 
and what is the logic you can say behind it, although it's not a biological thing to say, like the, log the logic of the system. But generally, it's what happens to a lot of the, the most, uh, one of the most common uh, modifications that a person can endure. Um, other types of modifications that uh, can happen on the uh, re residues of the protein are glycosylation, like linking of uh, uh, saccharides or polysaccharides uh, to a protein. Acetylation we discussed about, but this is like acetylizine, so it's an addition of acetyl group to the lysine side chain. Um, phosphorylation is very, very common. A lot of time for, for activation proteins that uh, are phosphorylated, are, uh, if there are enzymes, a lot of times they are activated because of phosphorylation. Uh, hydroxylation, methylation, and <coughs> carboxylation. These are like the main, uh, uh, you don't have to really remember this uh, by heart. It's just an example in general. These are specifically additions to the residues. Okay, so also it's um, like not all amino acids will have, uh, all residue will have all modifications. Okay, so there are certain modifications that are more common for certain residues because of the chemical properties of the atoms uh, inside the residue. So what I'm actually showing you is that you have a lot of amino acids that can undergo these modifications. So how many, and how can I say that this is like serine if it's not serine anymore, right? It has the the side chain of serine, but it has a phosphate that's added to it, or uh, lysine has another acetyl group added to it. So it's actually, what this causes is that we have actually 20 amino acids in general, but after the protein is made, because of these modifications, we can actually have like hundreds of uh, possibilities of different amino acids in general. Okay? So, yeah, biology is complex. Um, another type of, type of modification is uh, post-processing, meaning that after the protein is uh, uh, after the protein is made, it can be uh, cleaved, or some segments can be removed by uh, by different protein. And <coughs> these uh, these processes are um, very common in the digestion, uh, coagulation, like of blood, and program cell deaths. We're not going to get into that at all. So now we come to the last uh, step of the, like the protein life, is protein degradation. This protein degradation is obviously very important because if you have uh, the amount of the proteins that you have in the body and the activity uh, of the proteins that you have in the cell is obviously determined by the amount of protein that you have. So it's, uh, <coughs> and in any chemical reaction or in any chemical or biological process, uh, it's determined by the rate of uh, formation and degradation of that protein. So, how are proteins degraded? And, okay, so generally proteins vary, uh, different proteins have very different uh, lifespans, or what a lot of time people will say like half-life is one of the, one of the parameters that uh, people use to, uh, to describe um, to describe how much time the protein uh, stays around the cell or it doesn't get degraded and so on and so forth. So, for example, mitotic cyclins, proteins that are required for uh, cell cycles when cells, when cells in our body need to replicate, uh, for example. So these proteins are required for very, very exact specific times. And also the expression of these proteins or the abundance of these proteins is a very tightly regulated process, and sometimes, <coughs> and the lifespan of these proteins can be as short as a few minutes. Okay, so the protein can be made, and then after the cell cycle, the the phase of the cycle has reached a certain point, then it's degraded rapidly. Okay, so you can have different kinetics of these cyclins. Contrast to that, you can have uh, proteins that we have in the lens of our eyes that never uh, regenerate. Okay, so they are or never, hopefully never degrade until, uh, until we die. Um, <coughs> so these are the ranges that you can expect of uh, uh, how long the lifespan of the protein is. So the condition is when the, the protein is dead, it's no longer function? 
we'll, we'll discuss exactly the process of how proteins are uh, degraded uh, in general. So degradation, uh, there, there are two forms of degradation, of main, two main forms of degradation that we divide into extracellular, meaning outside the cell, and intracellular. So extracellular proteins, normally they're um, moved into these small vesicles that are called lysosomes, and these lysosomes have like acidic uh, conditions and also enzymes that um, that catalyze the uh, cleavage of this uh, of these proteins, but there's a, a completely different mechanism for uh, cytosolic or what do we say intracellular. When you say cytosolic, it means the cytosol or the uh, inside of the cell, <coughs> um, where there's a chemical modification or the addition. Um, normally, this is uh, done through a lysine side chain. Of the, of the peptide, and you say not all proteins have lysine side chains, but, ge but generally, if you think about that you have uh, 20 options of uh, proteins, and a lot of proteins have thousands of amino acids, then most of the time you'll have also lysine, uh, lysine side chains in proteins. So, and this is done by addition of a, like a signal molecule or a signal uh, peptide or polypeptide called ubiquitin. Okay? And this ubiquitin. <coughs> Then targets after uh, targets the protein for degradation in a very very complex structure called the proteasome, which is a, that we'll discuss now. So the process, yeah. Well, there are alternative ways to degrade proteins. If there is not a lysine, most of the time it will be like a small uh, peptide, and also it's not entirely true that. And that uh, lysosomes, or what I described before, for digestion of extracellular proteins. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I described two ways, two main ways of degradation. Okay. So we have uh, mostly extracellular proteins, and the digestion takes place in uh, um, lysosomes. Lysosomes. And the intracellular uh, takes place through the ubiquitination pathway that we will describe in the next slide. But in general, you, you understand that what I'm saying is a general is a general thing, and it's not the there is always exceptions. Okay, so for example, if you have a small polypeptide, you also have enzymes in the in the body that can just cleave proteins, and uh, if they're accessible or if they're just floating uh, around the cytosols, you you can have Enzyme which we call proteases or proteas, um, <coughs> like the one that uh, that is targeted by uh, ubiquitin. Okay. Okay. So uh, the pathway or the general pathway of how a ubiquitin um, uh, degrades a protein is that first, and this is not depicted here, uh, the protein has this. Uh, sequence or this uh, a recognition, a recognition sequence in a protein that the ubiquitin molecule, after it's activated by the E1 ubiquitin activated enzyme, which is depicted here, then <coughs> um, the ubiquitin can identify this, uh, um, this motif or this sequence inside the protein and it can target it and, and thus tag this protein. So the process is generally First, the ubiquitin, ubiquitin needs to be activated. Then uh, the ubiquitin conjugating enzyme, E2, is carrying the activated ubiquitin to meet um, that protein that needs to be degraded. And, this, and these two proteins, actually the, the meeting between them or the conjugation between the ubiquitin and the protein that needs to be degraded is done with E3 or a ubiquitin ligase. And this is actually... Um, there are a lot of ubiquitin uh, ligases in the, in the human body, so in general, uh, in cells, it ranges from 500 different types to 3,000 different types of ubiquitin ligases. Each one of them knows how to identify a specific type of protein, okay? And, <coughs> and thus, the, 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 specific, the specificity of recognition of the, of the protein is done through this E3 uh, ubiquitin ligase. And so... I'm not sure I understand. I, there's a protein attached to the protein, and then there are some other enzymes that... 
So that's that's the last process. That's the last step of the of the three step. Uh, so all the first three steps happen within the in between the between molecules. The first one, the yeah, the the two for the first two. Uh, steps are happening inside the ubi like the ubiquitin module becomes activated, then it con becomes conjugated to a second type of enzyme. I, I was I was soon show you a movie that shows it uh, like in a better way. There are other enzymes that join the process through. All yeah, the there are three enzymes that uh, that join this process besides the ubiquitin molecule, but the ubiquitin. So this process has repeated itself uh, a large number of times, and when you have a ubiquitin chain then uh, this protein is targeted to a very special protein that's called a proteosome that actually like totally destroys uh, the protein that is marked with the ubiquitin so it can be recycled uh, later by the cell this process uh, uh, got the nobel prize that discovery discovery of this process got the nobel prize to these three uh, people for Aaron Chekhanover if you ever heard Avram Hershko and Irwin Rose and they got the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2004 for the uh, discovery of ubiquitin mediated protein degradation. Uh, mediated protein degradation. Okay, so this is the main process of degradation in the cell. And hopefully, actually, this so this movie shows. So the little thing. So this movie starts from when the ubiquitin, from before the ubiqu uh, like after the ubiquitin has been activated. So you only see so the. the little thing protein is ubiquitin. You don't and see the E1. yellow protein here is a taxin 1. For ubiquitin... To so what they're showing here actually is that this is the ubiquitin already activated by E1 and this is the protein that needs to get uh, degraded. Okay, and this is the E2 enzyme that we talked about before. Because to proteins, it needs a carrier. It's called the ubiquitin carrier enzyme. Once our ataxin has done its function and it's ready to be degraded, Another enzyme will come called a ligase, the ubiquitin ligase. It comes and attached to it. And the ligase... So you see, this is actually the recognition. Like the ubiquitin ligase, or E3 that we talked about before, is in charge of recognizing the protein. That's why you have so many types of these ubiquitin ligases in the cell to identify a lot of types of proteins. We'll interact with the carrier and take the ubiquitin from the carrier back to our protein. And now it can put more and more ubiquitin molecules. The protein will have to have multiple ubiquitin molecules to be degraded. And now, once it's flagged, the proteasome recognizes, ready for degradation. The proteasome has a cap. The cap opens. The protein unwinds and enters the business end of this proteasome, the catalytic core that chops this protein into little pieces. And this protein will be degraded, and the peptides and amino acids recycled. So this is really what happens for many, many, many cellular proteins. This is a very important process. And these are the players. Now imagine mutant attacks in one. It has a okay, so this is just a lecture that I took from someone trying to explain like a mutation that they did in one of the proteins, so it doesn't really matter for us. Um, but um, so in general, this is the main process of degradation of proteins. So what do you have like? Any concerns about this process? Like what are, or any questions? Like what, something is not sitting right? Or you have any questions that, yeah? Yeah. Well, lysosomes are a lot of time present inside the cells. But they are actually they they enter the cell through a, like a mechanism of the, the it's like the cell is pinching off pieces of its membrane from the extracellular part and then it's getting inside the cell and then and there there are enzymes that are pumped in or the uh, pH <coughs> also is changed in order to degrade the proteins okay but in general this is a process to uh, to facilitate like and we're not getting into that uh, so much um. No, but what what you ask, what you need to ask me is why, what what's the decision, and why why is the protein degraded, degraded in general? Like why don't all proteins get degraded all the time? Okay, so the answer to that is a very good question, and the answer 
is that these recognition, recognition uh, sequences that the E3 proteins know how to, uh, knows how to recognize are normally not exposed in the protein. And only after the, or they're covered by, by a second type of protein or, um, or by all sorts of uh, other cellular interferences. So in general, you can imagine that, for example, if you have a, a protein that didn't fold in the right way, and this, the, this sequence is now exposed, then this is one of the mechanisms that will trigger uh, the activation of the ubiquitin pathway and the degradation of the misfolded protein. Okay? So, okay. Um, we'll take a break, and then we'll talk in one hour about all these.
Well, no, she was like [noise] All of her mis- standards are like look into a gun and like Yeah. [laughs] [laughs] Just shoot her. Yeah. [laughs] Just shoot her. Why don't you do that? [laughs] [laughs] Yeah, shoot her. Just shoot her. Why don't you do that? [laughs] [laughs] It's like we need gun shots here. [laughs] What? We need gun shots? [laughs] Oh. [laughs] Yeah, shoot Megan. Yeah. [laughs] That's right. She's shooting me. I'm shooting you. Okay. Yeah, shoot Megan. Yeah. Oh, that's what Megan was saying. Yeah. That's what we're doing here. That's why we're doing there. What did you just do? Oh, you just fired a round. Oh, yeah, I just went in. Morning. Shoot, I'm done. K, I'll do one more round or two more rounds. You want the lowest one, right? Yep. Okay. Yeah. [noise] Oh, so I can get a miss, right? No, no, it's okay. Yeah. K, so I shoot you, I shoot you. I shot the sheriff. Your turn, Meg? K, I'm done. No, it's Megan's turn. Oh, you just went, didn't you just went? I shot the sheriff. Yep. This is my turn. [noise] [laughs] What are you doing? Uh how many, how many do you have? [inaudible 2:00:12.77] How many do you have? Do you have five? Yeah. [inaudible 2:00:14.71] No, I only have one. But I don't have any gun sets. I have five. [noise] Yeah, but you wanted, you wanted the gun that I had. That's what she was saying. And I wanted this one cuz I shot you. So do you have any other guns? No, just that one. No, you had four guns. [laughs] Yeah, that's what I shoot you at. So how many do you have? Do you have three? Yeah, I shoot, I shoot Megan. Okay. You shot Megan. Yeah. Oh, this is so sad. Yeah. [laughs] [inaudible 2:00:25.19] Oh, wait, so that's not a gun. Oh, it's a pistol. Oh, it's a pistol. Okay, yeah. [laughs] Rifle. [laughs] [laughs] Rifle for when it's needed. Yeah. Yep. Rifle for when you're shooting Megan. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So this one's just a pistol. Yeah, it's just a pistol. But what does that mean? You just shoot Megan once. Yeah, and then she gets fired. Bang, Megan. Bang. [laughs] Okay, so I shoot you. Yeah. [laughs] Don't give me that face. I'm a sucker for it. Okay, miss, so that's fine. So yeah, so then that's fine. And then I shoot Megan. [laughs] Yeah. [noise] Don't give me that face. I'm a sucker for it. Okay, miss. So that's fine. So yeah, so then that's fine. Yeah. K, Megan. [inaudible 2:00:52.69] Yeah. [laughs] Oh, Megan's arriving. Paul's going to drop me off. [laughs] [laughs] Then when does when does Megan drop you off? I think it's two thousand, yeah. Well, it's two thousand six hundred and eleven right now. [laughs] [laughs] Oh, three thousand, okay. Six hundred and eleven. [laughs] Yeah. Six hundred and eleven, yeah. [laughs] Three thousand six hundred and eleven. [laughs] Four thousand four hundred and forty dollars. Oh, okay. How much was it? It was four hundred fifty nine dollars. [noise] [noise] Three hundred and sixty dollars. Three hundred and sixty. Four hundred fifty dollars. Four hundred fifty dollars. Yeah, I didn't see, I didn't see a dollar. [noise] I saw a dollar. I was like, I wish I had a dollar. [laughs] [noise] Yeah, me too. [noise] Or you can use it. Surprise! [noise] [noise] [laughs] Yeah. [noise] Or you can save it for your dad. Yeah, sure. Or dad's surprise for you in the morning. Wow, it's so like, it's almost like a little town, hey? You don't realize it's a little town? Like Hamilton. It's so small. Yeah. Hamilton is so tiny. Really? It's like this size. [noise] Yeah. No. No, it's not. It's like this size. Well, you should see it. It's like this size. [laughs] Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's like this size. [laughs] Yeah. [laughs] Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like a little town. Yeah. Hamilton is this size. [laughs] And then there's like Squaw, which is this size. Okay. Yeah. It's pretty big. [noise] Yeah. It's like a shopping mall square kinda thing. Like, where is it? Oh, yeah, they have stuff there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They have, like, shops there. Mm. [noise] Yeah, I remember I was a little kid there. Like, back in the day. I loved it. Um and then they changed it to Greenwich because the Greenwich Village is now a part of Downtown Greenwich. Oh, okay. Yeah. So they have all these really cool like retro, like, old craft stores They got them, like, the UNIQLO shop and Mm. Oh yeah, they have stuff like that too. Yeah, they got it at Lowe's. And then they were, like, Christmas stuff like, from Christmas time to Mm. Yeah. Christmas time. I remember I was there. Yeah, it's a huge market. Oh, they didn't have that since the eighties? Like, they had the Christmas market but it was closed. Yeah. Yeah. So they just had the regular store. But they had some really cool like vintage shops. [noise] Mm. They still have like a couple of the same ones. [noise] Mm. [noise] Yeah, like, one of them's like a bigger shop but it's, like, it's just a store. Mm. Mm. [noise] Mm. They actually have a lot of stuff in there. Yeah, they got, like, the, they had, like, the old, like, vintage wine store. They got everything from, like, the old vintage to, like, a modern vintage. [noise] Oh, they actually have vintage? [noise] Yeah, like, the bottles are all, like, pretty retro, too. Yeah, they're retro. Yeah. [noise] Mhm. I love it. [noise] Mm. Well, I know my fridge is totally different from what it was when I was a kid. [laughs] Yeah, it's super retro. Yeah. I have, like, the, my fridge is like a different size. It's not the same. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cuz I remember, like, when I was a kid, people would just have you know, the old like vintage wine store. Mm. They have really cool old vintage ones. Yeah, like my grandma used to have a vintage one. She had a gold vintage one. [laughs] Yeah, I have a couple of that. Yeah, my, my grandma had a, like, vintage ones. Yeah. She had a gold [inaudible 2:05:24.61] yeah. Yeah. [laughs] [noise] Yeah. [laughs] [noise] I have a couple of that. [noise] Yeah, my grandma had a vintage one. Yeah. [noise] Yeah. [laughs] [noise] I miss her vintage ones. [laughs] [noise] Yeah. She had a gold vintage [inaudible 2:05:26.62] [noise] Yeah. [laughs] Yeah. [laughs] Yeah, my grandma had a vintage one, too. Yeah. 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 She had a gold vintage one. [laughs] [noise] She had a gold vintage one. [laughs] [noise] Yeah, I remember it. [noise] Yeah, and she, like, she had a friend who she bought a hundred dollar vintage. Yeah. And she was like, "Oh, my god, I really wanna drink this." And he's like, "What's this?" [laughs] I want this. And she's like, "It's an antique." And he's like, "Okay." And he went and bought it. And there's still pictures of it. And she was like, "Oh, my god, I thought, I thought that was from someone else." [laughs] [laughs] Yeah. [laughs] [noise] Yeah. How could you? [laughs] [noise] Yeah. [laughs] [noise] My mom thinks I'm an antique. [laughs] [laughs] Yeah. [laughs] [noise] Well, my parents bought it for me. [laughs] Yeah. [laughs] [noise] [laughs] [noise] [noise] [laughs] Yeah. [noise] 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 Well, that's good. [noise] Well, you can reserve one. [laughs] [noise] Yeah, like a tradition. [noise] 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 That's nice. [noise] [noise] I like it. [noise] Why not? [noise] Yeah, I thought you'd like it. [noise] Mhm. [noise] Well, it's just under twenty bucks now. Really? [noise] Mhm. [noise] It's pretty cheap. Hmm? [noise] It's pretty cheap. What do you wanna get? [noise] Mm. [noise] I'm just curious. I have no idea. [noise] [noise] Yeah, you just wanna try your luck? Yeah. [noise] Absolutely. And then see what happens. [noise] Mm. [noise] Yeah. [noise] [noise] Yeah, sure. [laughs] [noise] Yeah, that's how it works. Let me know when you're ready. Okay. Go. Uh, garlic bread? [noise] Yeah, I think I will take a little bit more. I'll have a l- little more leftover. [noise] Thanks. [noise] [noise] Chancey, what's your wi-fi password? [noise] Uh, two five one one five Wait, hold up. Hold up. What's the wi-fi? Uh, the one with the five G in it. There's two with five G. The closest one with the five G. Are you f f oh, or oh nine nine? Sorry? Are you C six four Check the router. Oh, I have it on my Wi- F- I have it on my phone. One sec. No, no, it's okay. You stay there. I I'll just shout to you. This is done. K. Where's your oil? Yeah, what's the wi-fi? I'm gonna need s- Here, I'll show it to you in one sec. Can you hold the cutting board? Okay. What cutting board? The wooden one. Dude, guys! Usain Bolt lost. Yeah, no no no, like It's just, like, whatever. Just get a s- get like a small one. No, I'm gonna cut like Cuz it's gonna be more expensive. [laughs] Yeah, but the wood is good. I'll get a smaller one. It's gonna be more expensive. Yeah, I can't see the cord. [noise] Here, I'll cut it for you. [noise] Okay. You can cut it with your bare hands. [laughs]
my grandma really likes baby stuff. She, she, I think she has this like internal what is it called? Internal ang- an- anal rich. That she wouldn't be able to tell if she were in Japan or something. So she she gets really obsessive about this stuff and she started in study of it in Japanese. My grandparents really hold a grudge against her for that. Nice. Because it's a bit expensive to try. I was like, "Oh, yeah, yeah." [laughs] And you're like, "What are you saying?" "It's our attention." But she wa- she goes to town now cuz it's a year or something. [noise] Mm. So they really liked it and like my grandma and aunt were obsessed. Hobby is finding um Swiss chocolate mini spaces and then sharing. So she called us all out to her really large group of like South Korean people who like studying tomorrow. So it was like maybe the best of five or something. [laughs] And it's been good. I tried to teach her a few things, and I'm really good at it. [laughs] Yeah. I feel you, teach her. [laughs] [laughs] We want people who don't know. [noise] Well, that's not true because You do know, you just didn't know. No, they don't go s- they they may like it, but [laughs] there's all these hidden messages. So I'll be like, "Do you think they're smart?" But like, if they just don't do it because they're like dumb then they have the full attention but [laughs] Yeah. But I feel like they study them all so Yeah. [laughs] they don't do it. Yeah, I think there's a like an ethics thing with like people who like try to understand the rules of study and they don't do it well or whatever. It's just I would say now I feel like people are psych- are like always like there's such thing as negligent girls because girls are dumb. And they are, and statistically I think like every girl, I don't know this for a fact but [noise] I think every girl, I don't know this for a fact but [noise] I've never seen it though. Have you ever heard of like Oh. Dumb and they trained to like deal with it? Oh, this is so annoying. Okay, I'm gonna put it, then leave it at that. [laughs] This is so dumb. Okay. [laughs] This is so dumb. [laughs] [laughs] [noise] I know, I thought it was funny. That was so mean. Everything's so mean. [laughs] Oh. My god, you so sensitive. You're so sensitive. Yeah, you're like "Woah!" Like, you're so sensitive to your body? Yeah. [laughs] [noise] No. I I actually No, it's not What? [laughs] It's all like physical. Physical. Yeah. My god. Sorry, I was just like making sure you're okay. [laughs] [noise] I was like [noise] Like, are you okay? Yeah, pretty much. [laughs] [noise] I'm just like making sure. Like, are you sure you need help? [laughs] Oh, yeah, no no no, it's fine. Okay. [noise] Yeah, I just felt a need to like let you know. I mean [noise] Like, I was just like, you know, because I've been hearing about it for a while and I was like mentally going there. Like, okay, yeah I totally can relate to her being like "Oh, I need help" because I need to do this, this and this. And like, oh. Yeah. She was saying how like Janine's dating this uh psychiatrist friend [noise] who also wanted to get into the medical field because she realizes how different people work. Mhm. Yeah. So she's in this like, I think the the girl's name is Janine, and she's like, "Oh, I need to get into the medical field because I really like this person." [noise] Well, they're having sex. That's great. Yeah. That's great. And she's like, "Oh, I thought it was like people who like get into like medical schools because it's like the only way I can get back into the medical field is if I get into, if I can find a job." Well, they're having sex. Yeah. Meanwhile, the other girl's having the same problem. Yeah. That's kind of a problem. Too bad. You know. [laughs] Well, clearly they're having sex. Because then there's like the sexual harassment. Yeah, they're having like Yeah, that's kind of a problem. [laughs] Yeah. That's the problem. Like, I feel like because I've been working, this job has been like getting me to Yeah. a point where I'm just like, I'm gonna stop this. Like, I feel like I could probably still get another job Yeah. somewhere else. But Yeah. like, I wouldn't wanna work in the sex industry cuz I'm not into it. Um And also, I feel like I'm not anybody's target either. Yeah. No. Right? Like, I would be if I was looking to get into a job then I'd be looking more at the people who are more qualified to do it like what do I look for in a person. Yeah. Well, then Yeah. it's like, oh they must be like, well, I wouldn't apply if I wasn't looking in the first place. [noise] It's the people who are, who are actually qualified and who do do good at the job but aren't happy with their life cuz they're like, "I wanna change jobs." Yeah. Too bad. You must be like a different personality type. Yeah. I don't know. No. Mm. Maybe. I dunno. Well, this person was like, "Oh, I've never worked in the sex industry before." Like, they've never been in a relationship before. Oh, okay. So they're not like looking in the mirror every day, like, "Oh, am I attractive?" They're more like In touch with their own feelings. Mhm. Yeah. [laughs] Yeah. Interesting. Oh, that's so interesting. [noise] So I've definitely practiced what I preach a lot more so. What do you, what do you think? What do you think, though? I mean, I think that's really important. If you're gonna up your game and talk about uh personality problems, your relationship with your partner, right? Yeah. And also, like, how do you get to know your partner? Oh, well that's true. Yeah, that's a really good point. Like, how do you get to know your partner? Oh, that's a really good point. Yeah, there's no one else to look up to, right? You can't just go out and meet new people. Yeah. Well, that's true. But I'm saying, like, in a s- in a s- in a society that has relatively good It's also the people who are, who tend to have the hardest time understanding Like, I meet a lot of girls from a lot of different countries and then they [noise] Yeah. Because they don't really know what it is. Yeah. Well, because I think a lot of girls, when they do meet a lot of girls, they end up saying like, "Oh, I don't like this person." Or like, "I don't like that person." Or like, "I don't like that person." Yeah. I think It's because of cultural differences. Also, I think it's like, it's like they have certain ideas, and it's like, but that person also has their own Yeah. ideas and their own like, preferences, and your partner can't really relate to that. Yeah, and there's a certain number of people who do. Yeah. Because they're more socially awkward. Yeah. Yeah, and you meet new people and you can't really formulate an idea. Yeah. Yeah. But then you have to think, "Oh, this person is actually like totally different." Yeah. Also, the other thing that I really like about it is because I don't have to think, like, "Oh, this person is uh like one of those people that like, you know what I mean? They're always kinda doing their own thing." Well, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, but then it's like, it's also like a reflection of, like, your own personality too, and like what you like about them. Yeah. 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 Like, I think if I was to put a label to it, I think it's more like I'm more interested in the person than the company itself. Like, you know, I think if I was working in a company and I was working in, say, a pharmaceutical company, I'd probably be like, "Oh, this person is uh like-" [laughs] "They're probably like a lot more like intelligent, lawyer like, rather than like a pharmaceutical engineer or something like that." Well, even if you have a degree in pharmaceutical engineering, if people still think that that person is semi-intelligent, it's like, "Oh, this person is smarter than me." Yeah. Mhm. Yeah. Hey, I hope that person works in a company that actually makes good quality people. Yeah. Cuz I bet they don't have the kind of people who are actually gonna make good quality people. Yeah. 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 Well, they have the ones who are good at their jobs but actually have a better personality. Yeah. Like me right now. Yeah, no, Claire's the same way. Yeah. [laughs] Cuz she's she's going into this job interview and she's like, "Oh, I've never had this kind of conversation with a coworker before." Like, "Oh, I don't know what that's like." Oh. Especially if you have to like talk to them about something. [laughs] Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's that. Okay. [laughs] Yeah. That's a good one. Do you wanna text and invite them back? Yeah, that's [inaudible 2:06:49.26] The know how to do that. Oh, I'll text and invite them back? [laughs] [noise] Text them back? Yeah. [noise] Ooh, shit. Text them back? [noise] Yeah, that's what I do. I don't text back. Just you just text them. Yeah. It's more like how you do it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so if I go on a first date and I ask her out, she goes, "Oh, yeah, I'd like to go out with you." Oh. Text her back? "Oh, yeah, that'd be great." And then that's what they have to work with. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, in my world, it works kinda like that. Mm. It's just that sometimes a a girl may think that
to initiate this reaction. So in most reactions, although you have a lower energy in the products from the reactants, it still has a, a barrier or like a hill of energy that needs to be crossed in order to transit from this stage to this stage. And what that enzyme to do is actually lower this activation energy or transition energy. So <coughs> enzymes have immense catalytic power, meaning that uh, enzymatic reactions can be, um, I think, in the order of magnitude of like uh, um, 10 to the 6 or something like that, like more, um, um, they, they can catalyze the reaction, uh, the speed of the uh, chemical reactions um, by great numbers. And they also have a high degree of specificity, meaning that they're very picky about the, about the substrate or the chemical reaction that they facilitate or they catalyze. So um, the amino acid side chains of an, uh, are actually what, um, what determines uh, what the enzyme will do, the chemical properties of the enzyme. We will see it um, better shortly. In general, we, we, we would like to say that an enzyme uh, has several like domains or several uh, um, regions. And one of the important regions for an enzyme in general is the catalytic site, uh, where the actual substrate, uh, the substrate uh, bind and the catalysis happens. And uh, the other region is a recognition site where the substrate can, uh, uh, can be recognized by the enzyme. Sometimes it happens the same, in the same location, sometimes it doesn't happen in the same location in the enzyme. So we'll take an example of just one type of enzyme. Uh, our enzyme is uh, what's called protein kinase A. In general, any kinase, when, when, you, when you hear that a protein is a kinase, in general, SE in the end of the protein name means that it's an enzyme in general. And a kinase is an enzyme that knows how to phosphorylate uh, proteins, meaning that it will transfer, it will uh, tag a protein or it will transfer a phosphate group uh, to, um, to the target pro uh, protein or peptide. So specifically this enzyme, protein kinase A, um, like I said, at a phosphate group inserted amino acid, and <coughs> Obviously, different types of uh, kinases will recognize different types of uh, peptides or different types and facilitate uh, uh, different types of uh, phosphorylations uh, uh, to different types of uh, amino acid groups. Okay? So, uh, yeah, talked about that. So, in general, you can see here that there's a representation of the space filling uh, enzyme in general, and also you have like a kind of a ribbon. A representation of the substrate inside. So let's just make it uh, like, let's order it so it will be clear. In general, the red is the peptide that we will want to add a, a phosphate group to. This green thing that is inside the, inside the pocket uh, of the enzyme is actually ATP, okay, which the phosphate group will move from the ATP to the uh, target peptide. <coughs> And in general, this uh, structure has two basic uh, uh, conformations, or two, um, uh, two states uh, where, it can, uh, where it is present. So in general, it can have a closed, a closed conformation uh, where it's, uh, it's active and an open conformation where the substrates are released or bound in this conformation. So actually, upon binding, um, the conformation, the, the, the protein undergoes the protein, like undergoes um, what we call a substrate induced fit, and the conformation is changed from the open conformation to a closed conformation. It's like a, like a lid, okay, that's closing under, um, under the substrate. So, I'll just give you one example of how this actually happens, how this catalysis uh, actually happens, how, how can an enzyme um, um, speed up a chemical reaction that is, that, will, that is slow otherwise. So in general, now we're looking inside uh, the pocket that I showed you before, here, and we're looking into the molecular level of uh, what actually happens in the chemical bonds that are broken and, uh, and attached. 
So we have here the ATP, and all these, uh, what you see is the, uh, what you see here, all the circles are belonging to the, to the actual enzyme, to the PKA, and the blue here is the target protein which we want to phosphorylate. Okay, so all these side, uh, side groups you see like lysine 72 or aspergine uh, 1, 184. Uh, uh, the purple is just marked as a phosphate group, it's part of the ATP. Okay, so initially you have ATP has three phosphates because it's an enzyme three phosphate. So this is the alpha phosphate, beta phosphate, and gamma phosphate. And the gamma phosphate normally is the one with the highest energy, and that's what uh, moves, that's, that's a phosphate that will be detached from the ATP to form ADP and move to, to the target protein. So you can see that the, the numbers actually depict um, like which amino acid is, uh, this is from the end terminal. Okay, so in general, let's say the 70, uh, 72nd amino acid from the end terminal is a lysine, and uh, 184 um, <coughs> amino acid is this amino acid, and the 166 is this amino acid. One of the first things that you can see here is that um, that these amino acids are actually very far from one another along the backbone, but because of the specific folding, they come into very close proximity from one another. So the fact that two amino acids are like a, close to one another in, re in respect to the, uh, to, the, to the protein backbone doesn't mean that they will be close to one another in space, like no, opposite. The fact that uh, amino acids are far from each other, if we're talking about the linearized protein, doesn't mean that in the uh, folding state they will not be very close to one another, okay? So the exact position of all these amino acids is critical um, in order to facilitate uh, this reaction. And um, in addition, we have magnesium ions, where a lot of time we will term as cofactors, that these magnesium ions are also uh, bound to our uh, uh, protein kinase or to our enzyme. And what they actually do here in the intermediate state, what we can see is that these magnesium ions are actually, uh, because they have a positive charge, they're actually pulling uh, the electrons from the oxygen, they're not really like covalently, um, it's not a covalent link, but it's kind of an interaction. Is that part of the enzyme or the they're, they're defined part of the enzyme in general. They're like cofactors of the enzyme. We can't say that they're, they're not protein because they're ions, but um, <coughs> there are molecules that aid the, the enzyme in what it does. So in general, again, you don't need to understand the details of the chemical reaction also. We didn't discuss about how covalent bonds are formed, but in general you can get an intuition uh, to the fact that you know that oxygen is like a very uh, electronegative, it really likes the, pro the, uh, <coughs> the electrons around it, so this is in a sense like the magnesium ions are creating a diversion for the, for the electrons, and the electrons of the oxygen like um, are pulled, or the, or the molecule is pulled around here, thus the oxygen <coughs> Sorry. The oxygen here, the, the, uh, um, the electrons of the oxygen can do a, what we call an attack on the phosphate, on the, uh, uh, phosphate uh, atom and thus breaking the bond with this oxygen and creating a new bond with this oxygen. And this is what actually facilitates uh, the transfer of the phosphate group from uh, the ATP forming an ADP and the phosphor uh, phosphorylated polypeptide in the end. Okay, so the idea is the idea of around enzymes is in generally to create an environment that will catalyze um, this reaction in general. Okay, that will create an environment that is favorable for this for this um, chemical reaction to occur. Okay. Again, you don't have to remember this in detail. Just understand like the general, um, the general concept. This is just repeating what I said. And in the end, uh, after, the, after this is happening, then the, there is a, again a conformational change. And what I showed you before is that the enzyme opens and these two products are released.
So, <coughs> in general enzymes, um, the, as I told you, they catalyze chemical reactions, and it makes sense for the cell to, to put in pro close proximity enzymes that are, that one reactant is one product of the other, like one product is one reactant of the next enzyme. Okay? So let's say we have here an enzyme B that uses um, the, react the products of A, and so on and so forth, so it will make sense in the sense of the cell to pu put these proteins or put these enzymes in close proximity, and there's several ways of doing that. A lot of times you, you will find these complexes, okay, of proteins, the different proteins that are attached together. Sometimes you have like a scaffold protein or an or, uh, environment like the, like the membrane. You will, we will see this in this examples in the, uh, during the rest of the year. Uh, for example, where the proteins are all inside like the plasma membrane, and that's what they facilitate their proximity. And also during the course of evolution, a lot of times, one of the mechanisms or the phenomena that you can see is that a certain, um, sometimes like different proteins are, you, you would say like in the course of evolution, are fused together to form like one protein that has three functions, okay? that one product, is, uh, one product is moving to the other, like, and they're all part of the same protein, okay? Is that clear? So, this is a very short overview of the enzymes in general, we will return to that. The other type of very interesting molecules, especially, especially for neurons in general, are molecular motor, motors. And molecular motors are um, you can say special types of, uh, I don't know, enzymes, but they actually, they convert chemical energy to movement, okay? So, for example, I don't know if we'll have time, but if we'll have time, I will give you the example of the, of the muscles, okay? So, in, the, in our muscle fibers in general, we have these special molecular motors that move fibers in contrast uh, to each other, and thus creating a contraction of the muscle. And this uh, this energy is always uh, always comes in the for <coughs> for these types of uh, uh, molecular motors in the form of converting ATP to ADP. And there are also very uh, and this is like a molecular molecular uh, structure of uh, uh, of one of the typical uh, molecular motors, which is myosin, uh, which function in muscles and in general in other types of uh, molecular motors. We're not going to get into that uh, so much. And um, there are also very, very complex structures of molecular motors, some of which are very, there's a large debate about, uh, they're in the center of a, of a debate between evolutionary, uh, between uh, creationists and uh, uh, evolutionists, as you would say, about the the possibility that such a complex structure like, for example, this flagellum, which propels bacteria, okay, is, is this, uh, can this structure be made in the form of evolution? Like one of the, um, this is one of the examples that creationists give to a, a structure that is so complex that it cannot, uh, it cannot like uh, be formed in the course of uh, evolution because it's not a, it will require like an evolutionary leap and we're not going to get into it. Maybe if we have time, we'll get into it, but I don't think we have. So, <coughs> the two types of molecular motors that I would like to like, emphasize a little bit, because they're also very uh, important in regard to neurons, is uh, kinesin and dynein, which actually move, uh, uh, they move uh, uh, on uh, long filaments, what we call microtubules, that are actually all over the cell. And you can uh, imagine them as like highways that are going on the cell. And these ones are like actually carrying proteins, RNA, molecules, everything that the cell needs uh, throughout the, uh, the, cy the cytoplasm and wherever the cell needs uh, the specific uh, types of molecules. And also, again, the movement of these proteins is all facilitated by ATP hydrolysis. Okay, so can you think about why why this is the 
Ah, we have a movie. Okay, so this is one of my favorite proteins in general because, like you see here, this is like a cartoon, right? But this is actually how the protein looks like. And it actually has feet, and it walks on these feet. And we have a, and this is like a movie that shows the exact molecular structure of this protein. So, it's actually like carrying like a huge vesicle that uh, contains inside uh, proteins. And this is actually the actual movement of the protein. It has like a swing motion and an overhead motion. You want to see it again? Okay. So you see it has like two types of, uh, of motions and this is actually how this, this is actually how this molecule moves along the microtube. So, Uh, these two enzymes are actually uh, responsible, one of them is responsible for moving from the cell, you can say from the cell, uh, from the cell uh, body to distal regions, and one of them is, is in, in charge of moving cargoes the opposite way. Okay, that's why it's dynein and kinesin. A lot of it is because uh, the microtubules are polar. Okay, they have like a, a positive side and negative side. So they know how to walk in a specific direction. Um, the kinesin, actually I don't exactly remember which type of uh, charge is in each uh, location, but I think the kinesin is like anterograde, what you would say, like from the cell, um, from the area of the nucleus towards like distal regions, and the dynein is like the opposite, uh, the opposite direction, but again, it doesn't, you don't have to remember that. So just, there's a nice TED talk about, in general, about uh, molecular mechanisms, so I'll just show you the part where he shows like in a really nice animation uh, all these motors moving along microtubules. A bit of molecular eye candy. Um, we've got kinesins, which are the orange ones. They're a little... Uh, so there are, are different types of motors. One, one of them... And here are the dynein. They're carrying that very broadcasting system and they've got their long legs so they can step around obstacles and so on. So again, this is all derived accurately from the science. The problem is we can't show it to you any other way. So, one of the things I like about these uh, animations that I told you that you need to imagine a lot about what's happening inside the cell, so this is like, this will help you imagine. Okay, so you have this, every cell is like a buzzing motorway of activity in general, not only electrical activity in neurons, but in general like um, proteins have to be moved, shipped, and other molecules have to be sent all the time and also structures are being degraded and structures are being formed. So a cell is really a very, uh, a very live, and, uh, um, live environment, yeah, like a um, vivid environment. If you want, you can see this uh, movie later. Like it, it has a lot of examples of uh, really nice animations of molecular structures. So I actually wanted this to appear after. So imagine that you didn't see this. And why, why especially are molecular motors important for neurons? Can you think? Right. Neurons have a very unique feature to them, and that is that they're, they're a very, what, what we like to uh, term polar cells, meaning that they, are, they have huge difference, uh, like huge distances of the, of, the, of the actual cell. So the distance between, uh, so I just put here, because normally you'll see like this drawing of a neuron, which is really not a good representative because everything here, like here is depicted like the, the cell body or around the soma is like, the largest component of the cell, and you have an axon, and you have uh, small dendrites, and everything is like compact. But this is like a real life reconstruction of a neuron, of a layer five pyramidal neuron, <coughs> in, in this example. And what you can see here, it's a little bit hard to see, but in the red, you have actually the axon of the cell, and in, the, in black, or blue, or whatever color it is, then you have the, the dendritic tree. And one thing that you can see, that you can obviously understand from here, is that this 
this is uh, specialized, but and this is also contrast to other types of cells, which most cells that we have in the body have more or less like a round shape. It can be like a long round, it can be cylindrical, it can be um, with uh, different, different uh, parts. But in general, the, um, actually none of the cells in the body even comes close to the, uh, to the length of the actual, the, the, of the actual, uh, of the actual cell. So you can imagine that if all proteins are made here, all the, all the important molecules uh, are stored around here, then you will have to, uh, the, the cell would have to put a lot, a lot of energy in moving all these components along uh, these dendritic, this huge dendritic tree. And this is one of the things that this phenomena also, this, this problem is also one of the things that I'm working on my and PhD, and maybe we'll discuss that in the end of the year. So, um, just going on briefly, a mechanism for regulating protein function. So, one of the things I told you is that, like, phosphorylation acts as sort of a switch. A lot of time you have an enzyme that is not active, or not active, uh, not, not so active, and then, once it's phosphorylated, it then becomes active. So this is one of the one of the ways um, to induce activity or to modulate activity of the uh, of, of the enzymes or the uh, proteins that you have uh, inside the cell. And another mechanism. Uh, so we'll discuss the we'll discuss a little bit about like molecular switches, like phosphorylation, a switch from on to off. And another mechanism is conformational change. So this conformational change, what it uh, actually enables the protein is that is uh, to alter its how how would I describe it uh, to alter its affinity to different substrate as a function of uh, of binding of certain materials to it. Okay, so it will be more clear. In the next example, one of the most important proteins in general for um, for learning plasti and synaptic plasticity is a, a calmodulin protein, which is not this one, but it's similar to this one. It's called COMK2A. <coughs> but all calmodulin proteins have the ability to bind uh, calcium. If you remember, we have this uh, helix, uh, helix, helix loop, helix uh, motif that we, saw, that we saw previous that can bind calcium. And actually, we call this protein is, an, uh, is, uh, is capable of what we call cooperative cooperative binding, meaning that it, once it binds one uh, ion of calcium, it makes it, it increases the protein response to uh, more uh, calcium ions. Okay, so this actually causes this protein to be really reactive. Once it senses, what you would say, once it senses that there is calcium present, then it undergoes some kind of conformational uh, change that make it, makes it more responsive to more calcium binding. And this calcium binding is a, facilitates a conformational change in the protein that makes it active, and thus it can target uh, the peptide that needs to change the, <coughs> um, like a large array of peptides that needs to alter their activity. And this, is, this uh, process is very important, uh, especially in synaptic plasticity and maybe we'll discuss it, but not now. So, and the other type of, uh, of mechanism of regulated protein function is through what we call molecular switches. Uh, a lot of time, the, one of the most common examples is, uh, <coughs> is a, a transition from a GTP that will bind uh, to a GDP, okay? So this is uh, like a transition of stage where uh, you have like an enzyme that is bound to GTP would be uh, an active on state, and if it's uh, bound to GDP, it will be in an off state. The same thing you can uh, <coughs> compare to phosphorylation, um, where uh, in this example, this is actually, I don't know, but this is like a protein. Yeah, this is just an example of the other the other way around, but in general, when you have 
Uh, when you uh, add a phosphate group, it causes activation of, uh, of different enzymes in the body. We're just... Okay, question? No? You're shocked? <laughs> okay. So, I'm sorry that I'm going really fast, but we have to, uh, but we have to finish like this, uh, this chapter, and the most important part uh, for me in this uh, specific class is talking about uh, methods of purifying, detecting, and characterizing proteins, because the next assignment that you're going to have is uh, reading an article that the main thing that we want to get out of is seeing how they use uh, methods of uh, methods that we will discuss in, in this in this chapter in order to study uh, the NMDA channel. So you already have the you already have the article online. Yeah, question. Oh. You already have the article online, and you will have and we'll discuss this uh, this article the next time we meet. So. All the things, all the data, all the, everything I showed you about protein is obviously a product of research. So how do you actually research proteins? How do you... Um, so the, the first step in researching a protein is that you have to purify the specific protein that you're interested from the other proteins or from the cell. So <coughs> uh, the two most widely uh, used methods to characterize or separate the protein is uh, by uh, length or mass or by the affinity of this protein to bind to other molecules. So every, and, and we'll describe the two methods now. So the first method is just simple, simple centrifugation in which if you, let's say we take, a, we, take a, we take a cell, we grind the cell, okay? And we release all the proteins that are inside the cell and, one, when, and now we want to separate, <coughs> and now we want to take um, just the, what you say, the proteins of the cell, and we don't want to take what we call the heavy parts of the cell, so the membranes and the nucleus, and all these uh, components and organelles that uh, you have inside the cell are a lot heavier than, in, than proteins in general. So the first thing that we're going to do is just centrifuge this uh, uh, mass, and Thus, the heavy things will, uh, be, because of the centrifugal force, the heavy components will sink or precipitate, and we can take um, the supernatant or the uh, or material that didn't uh, that didn't precipitate for further uh, cleaning up. So this is like one of the most uh, robust stages where you need to purify a protein is that you need to separate. In the beginning, you need we want to separate like. Um, that proteins from the other molecules that you have there in the cell. A second type of uh, centrifugal uh, separation process is applying some kind of density gradient. So um, different molecules in the cell have different density. Yeah? Um, is, uh, are these methods for just taking out the protein or taking out a specific protein? So this is not, not specific enough. Also this in the next one that I'm going to try is not specific enough to to take, yeah, that's for to separate the proteins from the other materials that you have there. So in general, proteins have like a typical, you would say have a typical, uh, not, not only um, solubility in water or mass, but they also have a specific, uh, specific density. So, but, so the first step of uh, centrifugation normally will be like a, a normal centrifugation in an aqueous solution where you'll just get rid of all the heavy stuff. And the next uh, type of centrifugation that a lot of times uh, will be used is the density-based uh, separation, meaning that you want to take particles of a specific density. For example, proteins in general have, specific, uh, have a specific range of densities, and other molecules like uh, uh, phospholipids or, uh, uh, or other molecules that we that we learned about have different types have different densities. So this density gradient is just formed from mixing sucrose with water. From um, and you know that uh, what happens when you take like a lot of sugar and you and you mix it with water, you get something that is viscous, right? Like uh, like honey or something like that, but it's not. So when you when you have 
And if you form this gradient on this tube, then you actually can, and you apply a lot of force. I mean, like, normally these centrifugations require, like, the force of, like, 200,000 G. This actually causes uh, a separation and uh, a separation of, of the material that we have uh, inside our uh, vial to different densities. And then we can take just the density of the proteins. Okay? So up until now, we didn't see like a method to, um, to really separate inside the protein group. And one of the most common methods, methods to separate between our proteins after we, already, after we purified our proteins is to um, run them through what we would call like a, a polyacrylamide gel. So when you think about a gel in general, and that's true for almost all gels, what you see molecularly is that uh, these gels are actually like a sponge or like a net, a very intricate and very uh, dense uh, net of, uh, of proteins. A lot of times, <coughs> uh, also the, that's why we, you use also gelatin uh, in cooking or agar like we use in the lab, because it has very long, it's protein that have very, has very long fibers and these fibers form like tangles and these tangles together form like a gel. What we see as a gel is molecularly, you can imagine like a very dense net, okay? So this molecular dense net enables us to separate between molecules that are very long, that will have trouble moving through this dent, through this uh, net, and molecules that are short, okay? So, but as I told you, as, as you know, a lot of time, a protein, because of its folding, um, has very complex structures that n not necessarily rely on the length of the protein. But if we want to separate proteins according to their length, then we can add uh, <coughs> a material called SDS. And this material, uh, this is like, like a molecular representation, what it does is it actually linearizes, it stabilizes the, uh, uh, the, the primary structure of the protein. And another thing that it does, it, it in induces a uh, like a uniform charge along the protein. So, yeah. So it's the confirmation where it's just fully denaturated. Okay, what we said, like, uh, yeah, it's not, yeah, yeah. So this material, what it actually does, it linearizes the protein and also makes sure that it has like a uniform charge. And this charge is what's gonna, it, it's what's gonna help us when we later want to run uh, these, the, uh, this array of proteins through the gel and differentiate them according to size. <coughs> so, as you saw before, we cover, we like coat the protein and linearize the protein, coat the protein with negative charge, and then we apply electric force or, electric, or uh, homogeneous electric field through the gel. We first load the proteins to the, to the upper part, in this, in this case of the gel, then we apply electrical force. So what will happen to the, uh, to the proteins? Let's say if we didn't have a gel, in general, if we didn't have any resistance. Then, because the ratio to charge to mass is constant, actually, like it doesn't, uh, I don't know if you studied, the, this requires a little bit of physics, but in general, if the ratio of mass to uh, charge is constant, then an object will move through a uniform electric field in a constant speed, okay? So it, it won't matter if it's small or large. If the ratio, uh, if the ratio of uh, charge to mass is uh, constant, then it will just move in the same speed. But if we do this in, in the presence of a gel, then although the same forces are induced on all the molecules, uh, the frictional force or the the no, how do you call it? Um, I can't say the hardness. <laughs> the difficulty of the protein, difficulty of a, of a large protein to migrate along this gel will slow down its movement, and then we will just get a separation with size. Okay, so this is one of the one of the ways to separate proteins uh, by size. Okay. Charges it in, and then it'll be affected differently from 
so so no, that's exactly the the the, the point about the ratio, the charge to mass ratio. So if you have a it's just it's just from the physical properties of moving through a uniform electric field. If you have a, uh, every, the only thing that matters about, about like that determines the speed of the movement is the density of charges that this like in respect to the mass. So <laughs> generally, it's just charge ma charge to mass ratio, which is constant. Like if you have a long uh, if you have a long protein, it will have uh, it's heavy, but it has more uh, negative ions. And if you have a short protein, that it, it will be short, but it it will have less negative ions. Well, no, because um, because actually all proteins in general have the same range of density. The, a lot of times the density is something that is determined by the the atomic like the, the atomic content of the molecule uh, determines the density. For example, I don't know, like uh, <coughs> a diamond is a lot more dense than uh, um, than a protein, like in general, because of the conformation of the bonds inside the, inside the protein. So, um, proteins don't vary so much of each other in terms of density of the material. Okay? So, <coughs> a second type of separation, so we did like a, um, I showed you like one type of separation, but a, a, a second type of separation can also be done before the gel, Using uh, intrinsic properties of the the charge of the cell, uh, not, not the cell, the charge of, of the protein. Okay, so this is an example of a <coughs> two-dimensional gel electrophoresis, in which first we load the protein mixture into a gel that has a gradient of uh, different pHs. Okay, and what does it actually? And then we apply, and then we we will apply electrical force. Here it's not depicted, but in general you will also have like an electrical force. And in general, you, you can imagine that every protein has a different charge, okay? It has a different uh, combination of, um, has a different combination of uh, negative and positive charges. And under uh, different pH or different acidities, we know that acidity is just the concentration of, uh, of protons, okay? In general that we have, or hydrogen ions. So, under the right, under a different pH or different con different uh, acidities, uh, protein will have a different charge. Each protein will have a different charge. So, for uh, in this example, why oh, didn't see this? Just a minute. So let's take another uh, like. This just a just a basic like uh, backbone of amino acid, but it doesn't really. It's just a it's just an example that if this um, this molecule is under its isoelectric point, there will be charged positively. If it's in its isoelectric point, then it will have no net charge, okay. And if it's uh, above the isoelectric point, then it will have a negative charge. <coughs> so in general, you can imagine that this molecule, let's say it's a uh, uh, in this in this state, and we apply electrical force, then because it's positively charged, it will move towards the negative pole. Okay, it will move towards the negative pole until, <coughs> uh, and this will also go like in the uh, opposite opposite direction of acidity. But never mind, we're not getting into that. But the point is that you have a specific point or a specific um, acidity where uh, this protein will be in its isoelectric point where the net charge will be neutral, okay? And, and for each protein, it will come in a different uh, pH. Is an is an acidity uh, is an acidity level where the, uh, the charges of this protein are, uh, the net charge of the, of the protein are zero or neutral. Okay, it doesn't, it's not negatively or positively charged in general. Okay, so this is one way of separating the, so we first separate them according to pH or as electric focusing, and then 
you add the SDS and you do the uh, SDS electrophoresis. So in this method, you can get a two-dimensional separation, which can actually differentiate between uh, thousands of proteins. Because <coughs> uh, if you know from previous knowledge that, let's say, that this point, that, like, th that there is a, a protein that you're looking for that has an isoelectric point of, uh, uh, of uh, 5.9 and the molecular weight is something like that, then you know that in high probability this is the protein that you want to isolate. Okay? So, <coughs> another way to detect, we don't have a lot of time, another way of uh, detecting uh, or uh, purifying proteins is with liquid chromatography. I think I'll go through it very fast because actually people don't use this so much now in the lab, but in general, you, you pass the protein through a, you know what, I'll go over it because it doesn't really matter for the article. In general, we'll go over it, I think, in next class. But it's another way of purifying proteins. So <coughs> now let's say we purified the protein according to, uh, according to either, either electric point and according to size. But we want to identify, we want to detect whether, uh, we want to know whether our protein is, uh, is, uh, is where we think it is or whether we, uh, whether we detect it or the amount of the protein uh, that we want to study. So, the most common way uh, to do this is the utilization of antibody-mediated uh, assays. So, like we, see, we saw before, you we pass the gel, we first separate them according to size, then we transfer the gel, we just apply force in this direction, and we transfer them to a type of membrane or a page. And we transfer the protein to a page, and then we expose them to primary antibody that is designed to target the specific protein that we want to detect. Okay? So, <clears throat> what a lot of companies make a lot of money from is that they uh, purify a specific uh, protein, or they purify a, a part of the protein, like a peptide, then they inject it into an animal, normally a large animal, like a goat, or, a, or sometimes a rabbit, and they and then the, the, the animal identifies this as a foreign object and creates in the immune system of the, of the animal and produces antibodies against this uh, peptide. Okay? <coughs> a lot of times that's why you need to, you need to use like, species that are, little, that are far from each other. And, uh, and once, you have these, uh, once, you have, once the animal produces antibodies, then you can isolate them uh, from the serum. Uh, <coughs> of this animal, and then you can use, and then you sell, like specifically these companies sell antibodies that they say, let's say you want to target the NMDA receptor, so they sell an antibody that targets the NMDA receptor. Okay? So, after you separate the cells, <coughs> after you separate the proteins here, you expose them to what we call a primary antibody, that um, in terms of affinity, that's what we call like affinity selection, so it detects that specific type of protein, and then we add a, specific, uh, a secondary antibody just to see the primary antibody, and we can see uh, the levels. We can uh, so this is this method is called like a Western blot in general, and this is the most common method if you want to see like the levels of a protein of a specific protein that you're interested in, and <coughs> then this is the method that. Uh, is mostly used, and also in the article that we're going to discuss next week. They use this method to detect uh, the NMDA receptors. So, one of the most common... Uh, so, we have a way to detect the protein, and now we want to characterize the protein. So, like I showed you, a lot of uh, these uh, beautiful three-dimensional models of, uh, of proteins, then the way to actually produce these, uh, these models is through X-ray crystallography. And <coughs> what actually, what is the most challenging step in X-ray uh, crystallography is creating like crystal of the protein that you want to investigate, okay? So we're not going to get into the process of how to do it, also I'm not an expert in that in any sense, but not all proteins are easy to, to form crystals of. But in general, when I say crystal, I just mean an organized structure 
in which you have a lot of proteins that are stuck together and all of them are in exactly the same conformation, okay, in respect to one another. That's what we will define as a crystal. So this crystal is, is uh, illuminated with an X-ray uh, laser beam and this beam gets deflected and through the deflections you can actually interpret, not me, but the people who are uh, experts in that, from this diffraction a pattern, they can identify the molecular bonds inside a protein. Okay? It's a, it's, it's a very difficult like, mathematical problem in general. A lot of people like to compare it to trying to depict like, the size or the, the shape of a rock by throwing it into a lake. Okay? By, by anal analyzing the ripples that is created when you throw it into a lake. So it's a <coughs> analyzing like, the diffraction spots uh, that are coming from the X-ray beam. So, I think we'll talk about mass spectrometry next time and the method that we didn't get a chance to talk about. And just to a movie about crystallography because the article is centered around crystallography and then we'll finish. Why water boils at 100 degrees and methane at minus 161? Why blood is red and grass is green? Why diamond is hard and wax soft? Why glaciers flow and iron gets hard when you hammer it? The answers to all these problems have come from structural analysis. That's how the Nobel Prize winner, Max Perutz, summed up X-ray crystallography. Never heard of it? Don't worry, not many people have. Yet it's arguably one of the greatest innovations of the 20th century. 28 Nobel Prizes have been awarded to projects related to crystallography. And the very first of those I'm is... I'm just saying that one of the Nobel Prizes, the recent Nobel Prizes, is that or not, that she actually earned the Nobel Prize for crystall uh, crystallography of the ribosome. And uh, she did it in a very special technique like that was never used uh, before that. All began. It's now 100 years since following early work by Max von Laue, the first structures were determined by father and son team, William and Lawrence Bragg. In 1913, they fired a narrow beam of X-rays at a humble salt crystal and photographed the diffraction pattern as the crystal split the beam into many rays. Lawrence soon realized that this pattern held the clues to the atomic structure of the crystal itself. The equation he developed, Bragg's law, made it possible to work out how the spots in the diffraction pattern are related to the specific arrangement of atoms in the crystal. Two years on, and the Braggs were awarded the Nobel Prize. Impressive stuff. Not only that, the Braggs mentored a dream team of crystallographers who went on to work out the structures of a huge range of molecules. From Kathleen Lonsdale, J.D. Bernal, and Dorothy Hodgkin, to David Phillips, John Kendrew, and Max Perutz. Remember him? Plus, Rosalind Franklin and others even helped map the structure of DNA, probably the most famous result of X-ray crystallography. Today, the work hasn't stopped. Crystallography remains the foremost technique for working out the atomic structures of almost anything, which is very useful for finding out why things behave the way they do. From the metallic structure of the blades of a jet turbine, to the immune system fighting off viruses, Turns out, Max was right. Modern crystallographers are doing exactly the same thing as the Braggs, just at a larger scale with more sophisticated mathematical methods and more impressive machines. Crystallography is even reaching beyond our planet. The Curiosity rover is now performing X-ray diffraction analysis of the soil on Mars. But there's plenty of unfinished business back on Earth. There are still many thousands of complex molecules to look at and a lot more questions to answer. Okay, so and this was just a movie that uh, was done for a hundred years of crystallography. And um, so the article that you need to uh, read uh, for next time is not a simple article. It will be a lot of it you will not understand probably. Um, but it will be a good exercise to try to like construct the the story from the bits and pieces that you do understand. Okay, it's like a, it has a lot of like high terms that are regarding like crystallography and all sorts of the, um, terms. But in but in general, 
And it will be, I think, I hope it will be a good exercise for you for reading something that is very far from what you will do or normally do. Okay? Question? No? Yes? Later? Okay. Next time? Ah, you will also have questions. So. I will also publish questions regarding the article uh, before to help you like uh, answer them while you read. Thank <laughs> you.